Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show that endeavors to bring out the big issues on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, and the wide, wide world. And I'm Robin Adair. And speaking of the wide world, we have the Croatian sensation himself, my partner in crime, John Jurisic. And uh, John, who knew that truckers could be the big vanguard of the latest national protests? You know, we, <laughs> first of all, thank you, Robin. <laughs> wild weekend, wild weekend of protest and anger and, and confusion. We had truckers in a convoy to the BC legislature. You know, BC... It's, been, it's been just wild. This, uh, this whole movement has taken flight because there's so much anger amongst that 10% that are against vaccinations and against vaccination mandates. In fact, many of them are really against the mandates more than anything. And there was a truckers convoy at the BC legislature. We have truckers traveling all the way to Ottawa from BC. They call themselves the Freedom Convoy. They blame Ottawa. But you know, the funny thing, John, is that actually this didn't start with Ottawa. That's right, Robin. You know, the, the Americans announced that they would be requiring vaccine passports from all truckers who cross the border. That sounds very reasonable. We responded with the same regulation. You can't get into the States without a vaccine. And this has triggered the outcry. Anger from 10%, maybe 10%, I think it's much lower, of our country who refused to buy in on these vaccine mandates and other regulations to keep us safe. But just a moment, Robin. You know, this... <laughs> okay. So they have a right to protest. Okay? They have a right to express their opinion. What they, what they do not have a right to do is go and desecrate uh, a national monuments in front of our parliament buildings. They do not have a right to haul out Nazi flags. And, and they don't have a right to berate media. They don't have a right to spit on people who are walking beside them wearing masks. This is this is <laughs> pissing people off, Rob. Well, it's it's not the Canada that I know, and I, I I get very discouraged by this. And we are hearing some language that I think is not Canadian in its essence. I think it's very very, for lack of a better description, American Republican. And it's very, very tough sounding and it can sound menacing and uh, mixed messages, depending on who you talk to. So here's a kind of a cross section of some of the voices that have been speaking on behalf of this truckers convoy. I advocate civil war. If people don't want to stand up, we've got guns, we'll stand up and we'll bring them out. <laughs> The mandates, passport mandates, is too, it's too invasive. Uh, it just goes against everything that we have known as a, de a democratic people. Yeah, we're fighting for freedom, my man. We're gonna keep fighting, Trudeau. You have nothing on us, Trudeau. We're gonna win, we're gonna win. We're gonna defeat you, Trudeau. Freedom, freedom, freedom! As for the politicians, <laughs> Justin Trudeau's not sympathetic and not amused by the trucker's behavior, and now most recently has actually caught COVID. So I wish him well. Now, the Conservative Party, the so-called official opposition, a divided camp, mixed messages. Some Tories support vaccine mandate, some don't, some are not allowed in the legislature, some are, some support, some don't. Confusing. I think that it is possible to hold individually responsible anyone who says or does anything unacceptable while showing support for the hardworking, law-abiding, peace-loving truckers who are fighting for their freedom and their livelihoods and on whom we have defended, we have depended for our very existence. The establishment media has been looking for controversies with some of these truckers. They're trying to find all the bad things that someone might have said on social media. But you know what? There's a lot of people that are coming to Ottawa who don't know what else to do right. because their lives have been impacted just as much as mine and yours the last two years. And they're, they're trying to find a constructive way 
to let people know, hey, I'm not okay with what's happening. I think the Conservatives have made a terrible mistake, John. I think that a lot of people in this country are actually fiscal Conservatives, but are not Conservatives socially. And, and really want to see more flexibility in thought. And I think you're playing to the mob in a way when you say, oh, well, you know, maybe we should all have a rethink about mandates when the vast majority of people really want them. A few thoughts on the convoy that's just driven across the country, the trucker's convoy from coast to coast, and this notion of how somehow it is patriotic and freedom-loving to oppose vaccinations and the protocol mandates that are there to protect us. I have a lot of trouble with this. You know, I get it. We're all tired of wearing masks. We're tired of being told to stay at home. Nobody in their right mind enjoys the COVID mandates. We're sick of it, and the opinion polls reflect that. They're showing increasingly people want to see the mandates relaxed. And guess what? Dr. Bonnie Henry is strongly indicating by family day this month, we could see a number of the mandates relaxed. And that's good news, but COVID is still here. We still need to tread carefully. Omicron is with us. There's even a second type of Omicron that's with us. This means that it's still deadly and potentially dangerous, but we're reaching a tipping point in a positive direction. And that's because so many people have got their shots. The vast majority have rolled up their sleeves with gratitude, and they've done this also as a point of freedom. They did it because they say it's the right thing to do. Freedom doesn't mean you get to do everything you want. Most Canadians have decided that uh, we have to listen to our health experts. And this wasn't forced on us. This was a decision that people have made, carefully made. And I see protesters with signs saying that government has taken away our rights and that somehow we're verging on a dictatorship. Well, I'd suggest that people always vote in politicians who promise to protect us and look after our interests in the face of crisis. And guess what? I think that's what our politicians are attempting to do right now. So yes, go ahead, have your protest. It's your democratic right, but stop abusing people who decide they want to follow the mandates, they want to have their vaccinations. You know, it drives me crazy to think we're going to get through this one day and it's going to be the truckers and the anti-vaxxers who are actually going to take credit for solving this whole issue. <laughs> Democracy is not easy, but thank God we live in Canada, such a great country, strong and free. And I have to also say that uh, there's a lot of American Republican thought that goes into this. I hear Donald Trump has been encouraging this from the sidelines. And here's a message from Donald Trump Jr. And now it's going away in Canada where there are truckers getting together to fight against medical discrimination. There's a convoy of trucks, tractor trailers now assembling in Canada that right now is 70 kilometers long. I'm going to play the video at the end of this thing so you can see for yourself. Because when we get together and when we stand together and when we push back against the insanity, we can win. And that's how this all ends. OK, so this is a genius idea. <laughs> Robin, the, to have Donald Trump Jr. on our show, it, it almost makes you want to vomit. But nonetheless, nonetheless, here we are. They're commenting on our politics. Donald Trump is getting involved. Oh my God, these are crazy times. And you know, there's so much misinformation. It's extraordinary. It's all over the place. I mean, it just happened with Spotify, this insanity going on with all that. However, I know that BC's top doctor, Dr. Bonnie Henry, is trying hard to address this. So there's a few things that are really, I can say unequivocally, vaccines do not change your DNA. Vaccines do not affect fertility now or in the future. Vaccines do protect you from infection and from serious illness. And we know that they are very, very safe. Yes, every vaccine, every medication we have does have the potential for side effects, but those are very, very low. So while we have these vaccine mandates, and this seems to be top of mind across the country, we also we also have a BC 
leadership race, a BC liberal leadership race that's been going on and on. And uh, here to talk about the BC liberals and their future and the political landscape in our province is Brian Kieran, a veteran award-winning journalist. Let's zoom him in. And now joining us for the very first time in the Victoria Rumble Room is one of journalism's great rumblers, Brian Kieran. So nice to have you on the show, Brian. Robin, so great to be here with you. Uh, uh, back in the day, as you well know, I uh, used to take no prisoners, but I'm a, a kinder, gentler person these days, but still have my opinions. Well, <laughs> That's and, and great. Opinions is what we want. To, <laughs> and uh, we've got lots of questions for you, Brian. Excellent. And, uh, we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of uh, territory, BC liberal leadership, you know, how the government's doing. But I thought we'd start with something that maybe is a little bit more in our faces at the moment, or has been for the last week or so, and that would be the Freedom Convoy. And uh, Brian, uh, you you were in the press gallery starting, what, about 1980, coming over with the Vancouver Sun, then you were a columnist with the Vancouver Province, then you were government relations consultant. So you've, you've been around the legislature and, and for, for, for so many years. Uh, you're now the, the editor of Orders of the Day, which is a newsletter for ex-MLAs. And... Uh, You've seen in your time a lot of protests, and now we've had this truckers protest, both in British Columbia at the legislature and right across the country. Do you really think these, uh, these types of protests really gain traction with the public and change minds? Well, Robin, uh, quite frankly, you know what we saw down here. I, I live in James Bay, and we were right in the thick of it all through the weekend. Uh, it was uh, it was profoundly disturbing, quite frankly. Yes, I've seen a lot of protests on the front lawn. I've seen ten thousand people out there in the solidarity days, and you know when they really had a a beef worth taking to the lawn of the press of the legislature. Um, to see these anti-vaxxers uh, parading behind the exhaust fumes of these trucks, um, you know, trying to climb on some 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 kind of confused trucker uh, complaint um, was was pretty disappointing. I, I know the level of uh, frustration in the public is huge at this point, um, but um, you know, the, the whole premise of the truckers uh, uh, parade across the nation. Um, is is so basically flawed. I mean, they, they, we seem we're asked to forget that the border between here and the states is a two way street. <laughs> so even if uh, the federal government was going to relax its vaccination protocols, uh, the Americans won't. So I mean, it, it's just it, from that standpoint alone, this whole parade across the country is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, these guys could be at work. You know, instead they're wasting. Uh, valuable time that they should be on the job and they're wasting their fuel and they're wasting people's time and energy. Creating the divide between two different types of people when we've always been together as one and now it's just complete separation and it's devastating. I believe we have to protect our rights as citizens. This isn't about a vaccine or no vaccine. It's about what we're able to do every day. We saw some things on the lawn of the legislature um, on Saturday that were pretty disturbing. Um, I, I spoke to one woman who was coming from work downtown along Belleville over into James Bay here, and she was wearing her mask. Um, as many of us do around here. And one of these protesters went up to her and sneezed right in her face on purpose. You know, it's stuff like that. You just go like, it's, it's so profoundly ignorant. And uh, I find, you know, a lot of us down here find that deeply disturbing. It's fantastic having a guest who's so familiar with the BC political scene. Brian, nice to meet you for the first time. Um, I'm very honored. Uh, Robert oh. makes has a good fun with me saying how honored I am, but truly feel that way with you. Brian, we're going to talk about the BC leadership race in a few minutes. Extensively, that's why we have you on, on today. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about the John Horgan government. You know, I've worked in West Shore. I worked with Stu Young for many years in economic development. Uh, I got to know John, you know, I was never 
on that side of the political ledger, but he's such a nice guy. He's such an easy guy to like, you know. I think everyone can have complete confidence, despite an extraordinary 21 months of a global pandemic, that healthcare workers, the numerous ones I've met over the past number of weeks in different settings, are not only professional, but they're kind, they're caring, and they're compassionate, and they deserve our support. He's enjoyed high approval ratings. Uh, I think people are really pleased with the government's handling of the pandemic. What kind of grade would you give the NDP government at this moment? Oh, I think given the circumstances they find themselves in, I'd give them at least a B plus. Um, what we're experiencing today is, is just good, steady government. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in face of the crisis that they're dealing with, that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a big plus on, 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 their, on their part. I was um, in, as, as Robin well knows, I was in the press gallery all through the, for the 1990s when the NDP first formed government under, initially under Mike Harcourt. And Mike and I still communicate back and forth to this day. Um, it, it was a much different kind of government back then. It was a government that didn't understand how to govern. They were torn from within. There was competing elements within, within, the, uh, within the cabinet itself. Um, and Mike, Mike Harcourt paid the price for that. And then, you know, and others did too. Um, but we have four premiers in 10 years. <laughs> so <laughs> to see what's ha how that has evolved over the years um, and to see uh, Mr. Horgan take um, a, a very firm hand. Yes, he is a great guy. He's all, but he's, he's not a pushover. Mm -hmm. He, he has a very, very strong hand on government and, uh, the people around them are doing their jobs and behaving and doing really well. I mean, we look at um, we look at somebody like Adrian Dix, who had a bit of a clouded past coming up to um, his position in government and in cabinet. Here we find in a person like Adrian Dix, um, under the huge weight of the pandemic, handling the health portfolio in, a, in, a, in an admirable way. Uh, I, I was talking with Robin the other day about this, and I said, you know, one of the neat things about Adrian Dix is and since he's been in the health ministry, he's discovered empathy. You know, he's he's a different man. He's he's really um, he's really had to embrace the, the the better parts of the public of, you know, the public trust and the and, and the fact that you are a public servant. And that seems to come through. Um, obviously, he's ably uh, supported by Dr. Bonnie. Um, I look at their approval ratings there that they've been falling off a bit. And I think that's that's not to be uh, that's that shouldn't be a surprise, given the level of frustration out there and the, yeah. the level of fatigue. So even though there's been fatigue and there's been pushback, um, these people are still they're still scoring very high points with the public. So I, I really think they're going to be around for a while, given, you know, unless there's some unforeseen um, scandal in government. I, I can't see that coming. Uh, I think they're going to be around for at least, uh, they'll be around at least another election. So um, the challenge for the Liberals is going to be very, very steep indeed. Well, now, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the Liberals now, Brian. Uh, they're uh, at the end of, I think, the longest leadership race I can ever remember. I think this yeah. has been going on for almost a year. <laughs> and uh, it just seems to go on and on and on and all these debates and uh, it's it's been kind of difficult to watch in some respects, but you, you, you still are kind of curious to see what they decide to do. Kevin Falcon, Ellis Ross, Michael Lee, Rennie Merrifield, Val Litwin, uh, Gavin Dew, and Stan Seapost. So at the end of all of this, they're going to have their big vote. Who's going to win? Well, let's start with, uh, you know, if you met any of those six on the street, would, would you know them? <laughs> you know, I don't think there's many British Columbians who do. The, the, the sad reality for the Liberals is uh, since the, uh, the uh, resignation of Andrew Wilkinson is that they've basically gone, uh, they've gone behind a, a gray screen. Uh, they're not visible to us. It's partly the blame of the, of the pandemic that has robbed them of the ability to have high profile meetings and campaign out in public. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, they haven't been bringing much to the table. I, I think one of the saving graces has been the uh, quiet and steady leadership of, of Shirley Bond as the interim leader. She's been um, she's held every portfolio that a, a, a liberal uh, could hold 
from uh, health to, uh, oh gosh, labor. She was the deputy premier. She was the first ever woman in Canada to become an attorney general. Uh, she's had a stellar career. And I, I think she, she, of all the people in, in this caucus, she's at the best to serve, but she doesn't want to take the job full time. Um, looking at the rest of the field, the, the most talented person out there um, who's not in, in government at the moment of the six, of the seven candidates, of course, is Kevin Falcon. I want BC's economy to lead Canada's economic recovery, but with a special focus on women and minorities who have borne the brunt of the economic downturn. But that's only going to happen with a leader who hasn't spent their entire lives in politics or who has little track record to speak of. Today, I'm returning because I want to secure a better future for my daughters, for you and your families, and for British Columbia. It's time. Let's go. He left government in 2013, went into the private sector um, in Vancouver. He's thought to be, he's touted as the, as the, uh, as the leader of, of, of the contest. Um, but that comes with, with huge peril. I, one of the problems that we've seen has percolated up into the news in the last month or so was the fact that all his six opponents were going after him for signing up South Asians and Chinese people and claiming that there was uh, some irregularities and they wanted a complete party review of the process. Um, I think most of them not wanting to remember or not knowing because they're so green that the liberals, both federally and provincially, wrote the playbook on signing up South Asians mm -hmm. and, and Chinese people at leadership conventions. And gosh, Robin, you and I have been there. Well, you've seen busloads of South Asians turn up at conventions. It's the way it's, it has always been done, you know, so to... to but the problem that, that when that came filtered up into the into the dia, into the discourse, um, it it really gave the complexion of um, you know anybody but Kevin Falcon if you're in in government or one of the other three outsiders. So <clears throat> that has huge implications for 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 Kevin because it's a um, sort of a pre preferential ballot. Um, mm -hmm. If he doesn't win on the first ballot and the mentality is anybody but Kevin, um, there's a really solid, there's a really good chance that he might not win. Um, we just have to look back to uh, Andrew Wilkinson's run for the leadership. Um, he, in the first ballot, he wasn't first or second, he was third. Yeah. And it took five ballots for him to finally win it. Um, what, so, who was so, so Brian, I'm gonna interrupt because I'd like to build upon this, this momentum here. Uh, first of all, uh, I agree with you. Kevin is uh, an exemplar candidate. He's uh, the front runner. He's the front runner. He's the that front runner, and and I've 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 had him on numerous podcasts in the in the past as a board member of the BC Chamber of Commerce. I've interacted <laughs> with him numerous times. His campaign materials and videos are very impressive. But you're bang on. We have a preferential ballot scenario here, in in which really. If he doesn't win on the first ballot, I agree with you. I mean, I mean, so so who becomes the person that comes up the middle? <laughs> well, um, well uh, Michael Lee was uh, he was second on the ballot when Andrew Wilkinson uh, was the uh, and emerged as the final leader in the fifth round. So uh, he's he's back in the running. Young people are feeling that they're working harder and harder but they're still not getting anywhere. We need to do something about that. And that's why we are here. Affordability is more than just about housing. We also need to create better paying jobs. The world needs both our natural resources and our natural talents as innovators. Ellis Ross, the um, First Nations, MLA, I think he could be uh, he could be a strong contender. Um, certainly, um, Renee Merrifield is not going to be in there. I mean, <laughs> she got her she got herself um, between a rock and a hard place during the campaign by endorsing Twitter feeds that were suggesting that the uh, Bonnie Bonnie Henry was trying to get young kids sick to build up herd immunity in <laughs> Colombia. No, what, what I've heard, what I've heard, these young bucks, Gavin, do 
um, uh, the uh, the uh, Val Litwin, who of course are not MLAs, have no political experience, that that's beginning to to swell, you know, to generate quite a bit of momentum in the party. What have you heard about about this younger generation saying it's our turn now? <laughs> you know, quite frankly, John, I have not heard anything uh, like that. I, I haven't where I've been sitting. Um, I haven't been getting uh, that hasn't been percolating through to me. So I, I really can't I can't um, inform you on, in that regard. Um, clearly, uh, whoever if if one of the sitting MLAs wins, that's going to solve one of their problem problems immediately because they'll have their leader in the house. Yeah. And I, I think we have to accept the fact that there just isn't going to be an election for at least two years. <laughs> um, and almost, you know, unless something strange happens, the NDP will win another term. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask you, Brian, as I'll, I'll jump in on this. And we talked briefly about Ellis Ross as that other other factor in terms of people that could really challenge if, if in fact, Kevin Falcon can't do it in the early going. And uh, the thing about Ellis Ross is he's a sort of a, an outlier. He's an outside force, a, a First Nations chief who also happens to be a fiscal conservative. And, uh, you know, we, we had him on this show and uh, he talked about his concern about the cancel culture and how he wasn't really happy about all this talk about branding most British Columbians as colonialists or settlers. <laughs> Here, here's what he had to say. Well, overall, I, I don't believe in that sentiment. I don't believe in that narrative. Uh, reconciliation actually talks about the idea of two societies coming back together you know, for the better of both parties and canceling culture. When, when Canada as a young country itself really has no culture, you're trying to develop as we speak. And I've always said that if you're going to talk about culture, don't tear it down. Don't tear it apart. History is what it is, but add to it. So, Brian, there's a seventh candidate here <laughs> who announced his candidacy a month ago. Uh, absolute unknown to anyone outside of a small part of Victoria, that being Stan Sipos. Um, I don't want to talk about whether Stan Sipos can win or not, because that's irrelevant. He's not going to. But what he's coming across with is this kind of, I'm, I'm a kind of Donald Trump guy. I'm a kind of a non-political guy. I'm going to come in and I'm just going to blast government apart. I mean, okay, that's correct. But, but is that some kind of sentiment that you're hearing out there? Does, is that going to have any appeal within the Liberal Party anywhere <laughs> or anywhere in BC for that matter? I don't, I don't get that at all. Right. I'm not a member of the Liberal Party. But, uh, <laughs> these days I walk the fence with both ears on the ground very happily. But, uh, so, but I, no, I, I, I get a, I, I sense a recognition um, broadly, not just in liberals, but broadly amongst, you know, sort of thinking watchers of the current scene that the vast majority of British Columbians are sensible, rational human beings. And, um, appealing to th these fringe groups that we saw, for example, on the weekend, flying the Canadian flag upside down, sporting swastikas, uh, you know, I mean, just, you know, de defacing uh, the unknown soldiers monument in Ottawa. I mean, that kind of stuff is, is although it, it fills our TV screens on a, on a Saturday morning, um, we had four or five thousand of them uh, out out here and driving around my neighborhood in their in their honking trucks. They are a very very small minority of our population. The vast number of people that I bump into every day are wearing their masks, are observing the protocols, are respectful of the hard work that Dr. Bonnie has has had to do. She hasn't had a happy moment in two years, for God's sake. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think appealing sort of that Trumpy kind of appealing to the, to, you know, people who are just dissatisfied because they're dissatisfied and they can't really articulate it. Um, I don't think that has a lot of traction, quite frankly. Uh, I just don't. In serving these former MLAs these days, you know, one of the things that is a constant refrain from old enemies on on either side of the of the spectrum, the the, the enemies two swords apart in the house, they all to a man and to a woman when they get out of politics and retire and join together, they say they have far more in common than they ever did apart.
Well, that was fascinating. What an honor, Robin, to hear from Brian Karen. Certainly wish the BC Liberals well after three decades of a leadership campaign. <laughs> if they do anything well, they need to change that. It's going to be a tough fight against a very well-established and popular NDP majority. I think that's true, and uh, I, I wish whoever does win this race, and we'll know very shortly here uh, who the winner is going to be. Uh, they got a lot of work ahead. <laughs> and uh, talking more behind the scenes on how this leadership race unfolds on the night of the big decision, we're going to have Sheila Orr here, the former MLA for Victoria Hillside, now retired but never really retired from politics, mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. plugged in and always has an opinion. Sheila Orr is going to join us to give us the scoop on uh, why the Liberals did what they did and why they chose who they chose. And I can't wait for that, John. Oh, likewise. I can't wait, especially if she has a little bit of inside, because that's where all the political fun is, isn't it? Okay, Robin, I often don't wish that these things end, but they have to. Our uh, audience um, has to do other stuff. <laughs> Get on with their lives. And you know what? I'd like to switch it up a little bit to, and, and, and try to entertain our audience about the many ways in which they can support and like our show. So I did a little thing where I recorded a little sort of, you know, headshot of me driving you around the internet to where you can go to our Facebook and Twitter pages. So here you go. Here, please watch. Well, how exciting is this? We have six different ways in which you can like us, share us, uh, subscribe to us, delete us. Hope that never happens. The bulk of the activity for the Victoria Rumble Room happens on our Facebook page uh, right here facebook.com slash Victoria Rumble Room. And all of our videos are housed here as well as quite a body of followers. We have a lot of activity also on our Twitter page um, at Victoria Rumble Room 1. Our videos are housed at our YouTube site. This is where all of them are. It's like a server for us. It's really the only way in which we can deliver uh, this kind of a media product to you guys. Please consider subscribing. I use my Instagram page as the Victoria Rumble Room page. I hope my followers aren't too annoyed with that. Nonetheless, Instagram.com, John J59. We have a website, VictoriaRumbleRoom.com, and um, that connects us uh, via a podcast functionality to, uh, to our uh, uh, Apple podcasts, to Google, and to uh, Podbean. And so our vodcast via a podcast functionality really get out into, into the digital universe. I also use our TikTok page as a place to house all of our um, Victoria Rumble Room videos. Lots of activity here. Here's the address. Lots of activity. <laughs> Lots of crazy comments. So these are all of the ways in which you can listen to our interviews, listen to our comments, listen to our craziness. I really hope you like this kind of way of presenting how you can participate in all of the uh, media and interviews and chats that uh, Robin and I do on the Victoria Rumble Room. So what do you think about that? All of our bazillion listeners, write in the comments, subscribe, all that stuff that I just reviewed. Nonetheless, time for us to wrap it up. Oh, I'm so sad when that has to happen. However, we're going to be back soon. I am the Croatian sensation, the mayor of Upper Tulip Avenue, Johnny Boris Jurisic. And, and I am merely Robin Adair. And rumble on! Rumble on!